time in the presence of God, spend time in the, in the Word of God, spend time, spend time speaking with my fellow ministers. And I noticed, I noticed a pattern that is not addressed enough from the pulpit, and that's, uh, you know, we get saved by grace. Remember getting saved? Do you, you, you remember meeting Jesus? Anybody in here remember meeting Jesus? And remember how everything just started to make sense after you met Him. It just, it got so very clear that God is everything, really. It's just, it's, it's, it's Jesus. And if you haven't met Him yet, stick around. Um, we, we know Him, so we can introduce you. Uh, and, and it's, it's, he likes he likes meeting new people. Some people don't like. They're like, I got enough friends already. Uh, but Jesus likes meeting new people. But after we spend time with Jesus, have you noticed that often um, this relationship after after it starts out simple, it feels like it gets complicated. It gets so complicated, and um, the simplicity of our relationship with Jesus all of a sudden seems like it comes with a bunch of conditions. It seems like, man, I, I, I just, I believe in God, and I met Him, and I know Him, and I just, I just want to know Him all the days of my life. And, and then, and then uh, you know, I went to a church service, uh, and, and, and a prophet came in and told me about these things that God expected me to know and expected me to do. And I'm like, well, I better, I better add those, those things to my life, I suppose, if, if God is expecting that. And, and then an evangelist came in and told me that I, I need to, you know, really the important thing is I need to start winning the lost. I was like, well, I better start doing that, I guess. And now I'm trying to win the lost, and I'm trying to understand everything in the Bible. And then there was this apostolic guy who came to my church, and he had revelation from the Word. I'm, I'm going to make, I'm going to be honest with Chris, he made it up. I, but I thought it was deep revelation. I didn't know that. And I'm like, how did he get this information? I didn't get that. I, I, I better I better figure these parts out. And then, you know, pastors would come along and talk about how i got to have this perfectly healed heart, and i got to be able to forgive everybody who's ever done anything wrong to me. And all of a sudden, i got to stop having fantasies about harm coming uh, to people who did me wrong, and i got to all of a sudden start thinking good things. And I, I don't know about you, but for me, one of these things probably tripped you up, but for me, that was a full-time job right there, right? Just getting my heart worked out toward people that I had, you know, uh, put a fair amount of effort into planning their demise and downfall uh, and uh, them reaping what they had sown in, in, in my life. And then, out of nowhere, uh, the pastor brought a teacher in one time, and he started teaching all these different words for praise and these different words for worship. And I'm like, God, I thought I would read the Bible, but apparently I wasn't because I never saw any of this before. And all of a sudden, my very simple my simple relationship with Jesus was incredibly complicated. And I got a list of stuff I got to accomplish. And, uh, and, and I looked around, and I realized that the people around me, they're not accomplishing it either. And then I'm like, what are we even doing here? Like, what, what, what do we, have we gotten anywhere? Have we accomplished anything in Jesus? We're not getting any of this stuff right. And it took me a very long time to come back to recognizing that maybe, maybe something got a little overcomplicated. And, 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 and here's what, as I get older, I'm, I'm, I once was a young man, now I'm not, not as young, um, uh, not as young. I was listening to the conversation this morning, people were talking about how old they are, and my wife said, no, oh, my son is your age. And I'm like, ooh, that's good. And I'm older than her, right? And so um, I, 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 as I've gotten older, and um, I, I, I've, I've grown in a little bit of wisdom. And I'm less excited about ministers who make Christianity more complicated. I think it's very easy to make it complicated. I think the real work in Christianity is making it simpler. I, I, I think Jesus, in his ministry, was not putting more requirements, rules, and stumbling blocks. He actually was trying to take them away. He was actually trying to make it easy to get to the Father. And uh, I find now that the real apostles and prophets are not the ones who come up with the most clever stuff, but the people who just make Jesus simple and uncomplicated. This is what I find in Paul. And when you read Paul, Paul can be very, very complicated. Sometimes I read Paul and I'm like, bro, can we get a period now and then? Can we just... We get some shorter sentences. Like, can you can you work with an editor, possibly? Uh, but but the the more I study Paul, the more brilliant I have found him, because it was his goal to make this whole very very complicated Christianity more simple. Today, if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Romans chapter twelve. 
And uh, I, I want to I want to talk today. about a passage of Scripture in particular. And I believe that Paul, in the midst of a chaotic church in Rome, figured out how to avoid the distractions and figure how to lead the church in Rome in the joy of the Lord. Wouldn't you like that? A little less, God, how do I do this? And a little more, God, thank you for making life easier. You say amen. Amen. Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 1. It says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may prove what is the will of God. What the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And this is the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, worship team. Great job today. And thank you, mothers, again, for, uh, you know, birthing these beautiful people who are here today to hear the word of God. Hallelujah. I think um, the problem we have in living the life that God has for us is the same problem we have in trying to figure out what the Bible is talking about. We don't necessarily understand what Paul is referring to, who he's talking to, what problems he's trying to address. And so we're constantly trying to look for meanings where there aren't meanings. We're trying to put purpose where there isn't purpose. I, I met with a brother recently and he said, I'm just trying to find the reason why God let this happen in my life. And I'm like, brother, God didn't do this. You didn't pay your taxes and now the government is after you. God had nothing to do with this. Don't overcomplicate it. Pay your taxes and life will be easier. And in and, and this scripture that we're studying today, I hope you love, do you love the Word of God? I really love the Word of God. And, and, and this scripture today, it is, it is pivotal to understanding Paul's theology as a whole and, um, and, 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 and where we as a church are going. Um, there's, there's, there's major theological concepts in the book of Rome, but I, I want to I I communicate this as simply as possible so you can see how what Paul is addressing in Rome really is happening in our lives right now. And, I, and I, it's my goal as a preacher to make the Word of God make sense so you can hear God clearly and you can follow Him well. So we know by the name of this book that Paul was writing to the church in Rome. Rome is in the country of Italy. Good job. Back then they didn't call it Italy. It was the Holy Roman Empire and Paul in, in Rome was the capital of the Roman Empire. So, of course, uh, the leader, the Caesar of Rome, was in the Roman Empire. And uh, originally, there was the church that was in Rome, and it was run by uh, the Jewish believers. Of course, the Jews were sp- spread out all over the Roman Empire. They actually spread out all over that part of the world. And uh, right about ten years after the resurrection of Jesus, the, the Jews were driven out of Rome, they were causing some problems, and uh, and 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 they were uh, run out by Claudius in about AD 43. Now, this isn't just conjecture. We know this because the the Roman historian Suetius uh, wrote about it. And also, if you read in Acts chapter 18, it talks about how the Ro- how the Jews were kicked out of Rome. And you're like, oh, well, what does that have to do with anything? Well, I want you to hear about this conflict. So you had. Um, you had the Jews who were the people of God their whole lives. When they were born, they were told that on the 10th day, the males were circumcised. Uh, during every single Sabbath dinner their entire lives, their fathers laid hands on them and talked about why we keep the Sabbath and prayed that God would raise them up to be great like the people of their, the heroes of their faith. And, and in their entire lives, they were grown up with this identity as the Jews and then Jesus came along and started saving people, messed up their whole theology, 
But he began starting the church. And so naturally, uh, the majority of the early churches were led by men who were rabbis and priests before salvation. And so the church in Rome, uh, though it was small, it was run by Jewish believers. All of a sudden, Claudius kicks out the Jews, even those who had converted. And so now, all the leaders were gone, and the only leaders of the church were Gentiles. Are you following me so far? So, the Jews are gone, the Gentiles are leading the churches, and after about ten years, uh, they relented, and he allowed the Jews to come back. When the new leader came in, the new um, Caesar came in and began running uh, Rome, they allowed the Jews to come back in. And now, there was this conflict. There's these Jews had grown up in Judaism their entire lives, and now the church was being run by Gentiles. And now we have this cultural, religious, and philosophical conflict. Can, can you understand how that, might, how that might be? New leaders were running things different ways. It was the old guard who were the Jews, and the new guard who were the Gentiles, who were never discipled in God's ways. Now, the Jews, of course, had their identity was rooted in Judaism. And this is a belief system where God's grace made them be born as a member of the household of God. In return, what they did was they said, since we are the chosen people of God, it is our duty to live God's way. It's called Torah. And they lived their lives trying to live God's way their whole lives through the feasts, through the festivals, through religious customs, through going to the temple and, and uh, the keeping the Sabbath and all of the customs that they had was in reaction to God having chosen them as God's people. Well, now you have leaders of the church who weren't Jews. They were Gentiles. The Gentiles, of course, could be from any ethnicity, from any religious background, from any philosophical background. Uh, all they knew is that they were sinners and Jesus came and forgave them of their sins. And so they thought, wow, I have been adopted into God's family, and He has looked past what I have done. Now, unfortunately, if you get too much of that, you think that what you do doesn't matter, just what you believe that matters. And so all of a sudden you have this group of church leaders in Rome when the Jews come back living just like the world, living no more sanctified than their unsaved friends, living no more holy than those who deny God, leading the church. But they had a firm grasp of God's saving grace, but they had no revelation of God's requirements for His people. And so there's a conflict. The Jews came back and they're like, well, we're going we're gonna to whip this church into order. And Paul's like, whoa, whoa, this is, this, it's not going to work this way. And so there's this conflict happening in the church of Rome that Paul is writing a letter in part to settle this problem without giving them more rules, without giving them more requirements, without giving more stumbling blocks to follow Jesus. And He's writing a letter and telling them how to be followers of God, and he's validating partially both groups. He's validating how God is revealed in the Jewish Bible, how God has revealed Himself in His ways, and the ongoing need that the Gentiles had, that they had grasped this ongoing relationship with the risen God, not just through customs and ceremonies, but by encountering the grace of God. And so, as Paul writes this really deep letter that people have been preaching ever since, in the first 11 chapters, he starts laying out this common history that all of humanity has. This amazing part about the Bible is you are in a hard part and you're in a hard season. I want to tell anybody listening to me right now, either online or in person, when you find yourself in crisis and you don't know what to do, begin reading the Psalms. Read the Psalms every day and read them like they're your own prayers. And God will begin speaking to you right where you're at. And you'll recognize that what the psalmists were experiencing is no different than what we experience today. 
We have some different names for it and some different words, but the human condition has been eternally struggling. And God speaks to it in the Scriptures. Read the Gospels and ask God, speak to me through your Word, and you will get words from God about your very situation. It is crazy, but it is true. Can you say amen? I have experienced in this in my life time and again, and I would encourage you to lean into it. But Paul is trying to write these first 11 chapters, trying to, trying to lay out to the readers, like I said, this common history that all humanity has. And he's narrowing down on these two main themes. The first thing he hits is that our sinful lives cause us to worship false gods of fame, gods of lust, gods of greed. And, and Paul talks about this. He says that to worship them is, is, is foolish to give our lives of worship to these false gods. And, and, uh, and, and, and because we worship false gods, he says, our minds become corrupted. He lays this out in Romans chapter 1. He's telling them, when we decide to live life away from God, God's like, all right, you want to move out? That's fine. But when you move out of my grace, unfortunately, you can't control the powers around you circulating through your mind and taking over your thought life. And he goes on a litany of problems that happens. With the mind without God is open to anything the enemy has for it. He says here in Romans chapter 1, verse 28, he just begins to rattle off some problems that people have when they turn their mind away from God. He says, oh, they've been filled with unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossip, slanders, haters of God, insolvent, arrogant, boasters, inventors of evil, for Mother's Day, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unfeeling, and unmerciful. Can you believe that disobedient to parents is right up there with murderers? That's why in the law it says take the rebellious child out to the city limits and you stone them, right? And since then, kids have been getting stoned thinking that they're fulfilling the will of God. Okay, bad, bad joke, bad joke. All right, all right. They're trying to get high. Anyway, so... And so he's addressing this. Listen, when we, when we, don't, when we don't set our minds, when we don't, we don't sanctify it for God, bad things happen, and it overtakes our lives. And the, second, the second thing he tries to say is that because we're without God, our lives don't reflect that we're made in His image. The second thing is, in Romans chapter 6, he kind of drills down on the fact that we get a little too comfortable with ourselves. We, the Jews, he starts addressing, he's like, man, you thought the law was enough. You think like, man, just because you're born in the house of God and you're keeping what you believe to be the law, that's enough for you. And I meet Christians like this all the time. Mike and I run into Christians, and maybe you do as well, as you begin to share your faith with them. They begin to give you the reasons why they don't need to do anything more than what they did when they were born. They will say things like, oh, no, no, I'm Catholic. I'm, 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 I'm good. I'm like, that's funny. I didn't, I didn't see that clause in the Bible that, you know, this word is for everyone except Catholics. And I was raised Episcopalian, and so when people would witness to me, I'd tell them, no, no, no I'm Episcopalian. I'm good. As if that one law was enough. Uh, I'm Methodist, or, uh, you know, my, my uncle. I even would have people tell you, you know, my grandfather's a pastor. I'm well, well, like, well, he's in heaven. Would you like to go with him? Like, you know, we can talk about that. We can address that today, because just this one thing is not enough. And it's funny as Christians that we so often will will judge the Jews because they say, oh, they're God's people and they didn't accept you. I, there's, I mean, there's more Christians who call themselves Christians that there's no evidence in their lives at all that they're followers of Jesus Christ than there are Jews. Can we say amen? Can we talk about our house? Let's not talk about their house. Let's talk about our house. How many people who identify as Christian, but nothing in their life identifies as Christianity? I'm not judging anybody. I'm, let's just be realistic here. 
reason I'm going to go through these uh, poll numbers in another message that I'm preparing, but they, uh, the latest statistics are out, and somewhere around 70-some percent of Americans identify as Christian. In, in today's day and age, over 70% of Americans identify as Christian. Would you like to guess how many are actually what we would call practicing Christians? They go to church every week, they read their Bible, they, they financially contribute to the church. Would you like to guess? In America, anybody want to throw out a number? 4%. It is 4% of Americans are actually practicing Christians. We got a mission field. We live in the mission field. We live in a nation, and in, 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 let's, just, let's, just, let's just be honest. What's worse than, than not being a Christian? Thinking you are one. When you're not. Because if you're not, at least you're open to the gospel because you don't think you already have it. But if you think you already got it right, well, there's no help. If you think you've got everything there already is, there's i got nothing to offer you, but at least the sinner who is bound in their sin knows they need some help. I, I, I counsel people a lot, and I disciple uh, young pastors that I, that I meet with regularly, and they say, oh, i got this person, they got all these issues happening in their lives, and they're not really listening to me, and I tell them, man, stop offering advice to people who don't think they have a problem. Wait for people who have problems. Help people who have problems. If you don't have a problem, I don't have a solution. I can't care more about you than you do, right? And if you, you know, your marriage is, if it might be going down the can, you know, and if you don't think you have a problem, I don't have a solution. But if you like a marriage that lasts a quarter century, I have, I have some things to offer. Hello. Anybody listen to me? Are we on the same page here? But there's all these people who are calling themselves Christians, but they don't actually follow Jesus. And what do we do about that? Well, 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 we, we need to have experiences with the living God. We, we need to have some fruit that looks tasty. Funny thing about fruit, it's filled with sugar. You, you heard the story of Steve Jobs, right? He had this pancreatic cancer. And, uh, and uh, he was like, I'm not going to listen to the doctors. I'm going to do a holistic diet. And he thought he was going to heal himself. He had a, he had a, had a bit of a Messiah complex. And so instead of having this very treatable pancreatic cancer removed from his life, he went on a, on a fruit diet. As if, you know, oranges are going to heal pancreatic cancer, right? And so he started eating all this fruit, be- believing that he would be able to heal himself. Unfortunately, the type of pancreatic cancer he had grows more quickly the more sugar you eat. And so becoming his own god, he caused his own demise. Now, I don't know where Steve Jobs is spending eternity. I'm, don't, don't, don't hear me on that. I have no idea. I didn't know the man. I don't know his faith. I don't have any idea. But I know that when we make ourselves our own God, we're, 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 not, we're, we're doomed. We're heading down fast. And, and people will say, no, no, I was born a certain, certain label, or when I was a kid, I did this, and now I'm good. This, we've got to have more than, oh, well, that, that's good. We, we say, well, actually, are you, are you bearing fruit? Let me, let me show you the fruit of my life, because the fruit is sweet. Now, we all want a solution that's nothing but sweet. However, sometimes we've got to eat a little bit of bitterness so we can get healed. And Paul is trying to put in their faces here the same thing he's putting in our faces. Listen, we've got two calamities happening to all of humanity. On one side, we feel like I'm, I was born fine the first time. I don't need to be born again. On the second side, we say, well, you know, I just, I believe in my heart and that's probably good enough. And Paul is saying, um, no, that actually, that, that, that does not fit the bill. It's not going to solve the problems that the world has. This is what he said to Rome, the Romans in Romans chapter 6, verse 13. He says, don't go on presenting the parts of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present to God as those who are alive from the dead and your body's parts as instruments of righteousness to God. As a believer in Jesus Christ, there is a life. Like, I I, um, I wish I had better words. I wish I could convince you. I wish I could take a snapshot of what it's like to be in a room 
open the Word of God and the Spirit of God is just hovering in the room, or you share a testimony with somebody, and as you're listening to a brother or a sister tell you a testimony, and your heart begins to burn. I mean, you feel a physical burning on the inside of you because the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God in them begins to agree with the Spirit of God in you, and you experience a spiritual experience because you're connecting on a spiritual level that you never could on a physical level because you have made yourself so vulnerable to the living God that He's moving inside of you. You're experiencing His joy in the midst of someone sharing their testimony and and, and, and this is the life that God has called us to. He's called us to this life where we're enjoying one another. I was, I was at a, um, I'm going I'm to tell on myself a little bit. I was at a homeschool graduation yesterday. And um, I'm going to reserve my comments. Um, uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> We're family here, right? My wife is, is, is cringing a little bit. I was cringing a little bit. If I can be very honest with you, I was cringing in the homeschool graduation. Because the theme, um, if, you're, if you homeschool and you think that's best for your family, I'm glad we're in a country that allows you to do that. Amen? Let me just paint a picture. Can I, are, are we good? Are you guys, are we good? Can I just talk for a minute? I need you to talk back. See, I need you to help me preach a little bit. I need, to, I need to be in conversation. I need a little back and forth. I need to know that we're all here together. Uh, so let me just tell you this. I don't want to offend anybody in here. But, the, we're, but it's in a church. And we start off with the Pledge of Allegiance. And I'm like, why are we pledging allegiance to anything other than Jesus in a church? I, I'm never pledging my allegiance to anything but Jesus. And in our church, the Revival Life, we've never had flags on stage um, because Jesus didn't have a flag, right? Uh, we, we, I, I pledge my allegiance to Jesus. And there's not a possibility I'd see the cross and say, oh, that flag is a good thing for me to serve. I could, what's that flag going to do for you? When you're at the bottom of the sin pit and you can't get your way out, pray to that flag. Watch what happens. Nothing. I've given my allegiance to Jesus already. I'm not pledging it to anything else. So normally when people do the pledge, I stand, I'm a vet. You know, I'm, it's, my dad was a vet. My grandfather's a vet. Grandfather, great-grandfather's a vet. Like, like, I stand up and I say the Lord's Prayer. That's what I do. You know, I, I don't want to offend anybody. That's what I do. I stand up, I say the Lord's Prayer, and that's it. Except this time, it was just my daughter and I looking at each other, kind of smiling, because she knew I, don't, I wasn't about to do that, and I knew she wasn't. So we start with that, which I thought was a little, little, little odd. And um, I'm, I'm glad that I'm glad that we're in a country that that um, that we're in a city where if you feel like your child's needs are best met by homeschooling or whatever situation that that's available, I'm happy. I'm I'm, I'm happy for it. Um, but the idea that you know the, the fear mongering that our world is going to hell and and the only thing that can protect our kids from the evil out there is mom. Oh, I'm like, oh, mm, mm. I'm like, this is so close to the gospel, but it's not, right? I, it, it, I, hear, hear me. Um, when 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 Tracy and I decided to raise our um, children, and they got to be near high school, we're like, man, I want to, I want to navigate the world with them. And, and these folks had mom be watching them 24/7. Now they're going to send their kids off to university. Good luck with that. Good, like, good luck. The first time out is going to be at 19. That, that don't sound like a good plan to me. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Uh, it, like, and, and so I, I'm like, it's our responsibility as Christians to help people navigate this world. There was this picture being painted that there's this awful, awful, terrible world that's looking to make your kids get pregnant and on heroin as soon as they step outside the house. <laughs> like, if they just meet the wrong friend, all of a sudden, they're probably going to be prostituted. Who knows? You know, who knows? They're just going to start smoking crack. I'm like, you know that costs money, and you don't give them any, so that's not really an option. And I'm like, man, I, I just feel like Jesus has called us to actually bear fruit in the world. Because they, they are unable to eat directly from Jesus. And so we're bearing fruit for the world that they cannot feed themselves. 
I'm to be salt and light, preserving the world. And I'm going to teach my kids how to just navigate this crazy world that is pulling them in 15 different directions and yet be centered in Christ. Does anybody feel what I'm talking about here? And, and so there's this, there's this, there's this life change that, that Paul is talking about. Look, when you get saved, the Holy Ghost moves in. You are no longer sinners. You are alive from the dead. I, I want us to think about that for a moment. Alive from the dead. If you've not given your life to Jesus, you're spiritually dead. I'm not saying that to harm anybody. You're like, oh, I have a very personal relationship with Jesus. Great. Let's make it public. Let's get water baptized. I don't know about that. Well, when you're ready, let's do that. Let's make it public. Let's go ahead and move in the direction of maturity. Let, 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 let's accelerate the learning curve so this, us being alive from the dead, we can bear fruit for the people around us to eat from. Paul is giving a theological idea here that, man, you once were dead. I need you to recognize you've accepted Jesus as your Savior. Yes, yes, you are different. You're no longer the same. You are once dead, but now you've crossed over into life. And not only are you a live believer, you carry life on the inside of you so that those around you can eat of that same life. I want you to know that you carry the life alive from the dead. You have a life-giving force on the inside of you. It's called Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. And He moves through you. And where you go, He goes. And as you follow Him, fruit starts to come out of your life. And the fruit is so delicious. It, it, other people come around and they want to eat from it. They want to eat some of your fruit. And the Bible tells us the more you give away that fruit, the more you get to give away. It is amazing. Some people, they don't even know they're following Jesus yet, but they just start inviting people to church. They don't recognize. You know what that is? That's you bearing fruit. That is the fruit of the Spirit in your life, and people are noticing you are bearing fruit, and I want some of that fruit. And they just come to you, they come to you, they come to you, and you're like, listen, you can eat my fruit, but I've got a place where you can come, and you can begin to bear your own fruit, and you get to eat some of it, and you get to give a bunch of it away. It is an amazing life. It's called being a Christian. It's called being a follower of the living God, having the holy God living on the inside of you in a way that you are alive from the dead. This is why it's important for you to tell your testimony to people. Save the lost people alike. You've got to remember that you aren't always this pretty. You didn't always have it together. You didn't always have it figured out. There was a time that you did not know God, but now, by the grace of God, you do. And that, that, is, that is miraculous. It's miraculous. And so Paul is trying to get these Christians who are focused on who's going to be in charge to say, man, y'all, y'all are y'all are missing it a little bit here, and you all have something to add to the story that God is creating in Rome. And so, in church, in, in, in Romans chapter twelve, he he begins to pivot. As you study the book of Romans, Romans chapter twelve, he begins to pivot. Here in verse one of Romans chapter twelve, he says, therefore. I urge you, brothers and sisters, therefore. Now, therefore means up until this point, the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans was all for him to lead to this sentence. That's Paul talking for a very long time, laying out an argument, preparing for this pivot right here, this this adverb, therefore. It's a long thought. So we tend to chop up the Bible into little phrases and sentences, but for Paul, all eleven chapters were one cogent thought with two themes. And he says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters. This is Paul the genius, Paul the apostle, beginning to address his people. For he calls them brothers and sisters to let them know, hey, I I I look at you as as family to me, but the urge, or your Bible may say exhort, or your Bible may say extol. What it means is if you look at the context and you look at the background of the word, he's not just saying, hey, um, me personally I find this important. No, no, no. He's saying, as an apostle, with the authority that I have as an apostle, I am telling you what I'm about to say is important. And if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, 
we need to take this as being important. All believers in our lives need somebody, need a Paul in their lives. That will tell you, hey, I know you find yourself going in the right direction, but you need to hear... Wait, wait, stop. You need to hear this now, and you need to listen. We all need that in our lives. We need more mature believers who are able to say, I hear everything you've told me, uh, but it, I would say that it is all delusion. It is all a little crazy. And not only that, it's not biblical. We need to get back to the basics of what God is doing in our lives. We need believers, older believers in our lives to say, brother, you're shooting a little too low. I believe you can do even more than that. I believe God is, is, is calling you out to be even greater than what you think you're going to be. I want you to step out in faith in this next season. If you do not have somebody in your life who sees the gift of God in your life and sees the potential of God in your life and is calling you to be the greatest that God has called you to be, press in for that. Pray for that. Talk to me about it. Talk to Pastor Tracy. Talk to some of the leaders. Get somebody in your life who will open the Word of God with you and say, listen, I know that you thought that this was your ceiling, but that's actually your floor. God has called you to something so much greater. And as a matter of fact, I will pray for you. I will lay hands on you and I will believe God that His grace will do this in your life. This is what Paul is doing. I am urging you, brothers and sisters. Then he goes on. By the mercies of God, present your bodies as living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. I highlighted this because we tend to fall in the grouping with the Jews when we read this sentence. We tend to fall into the grouping of the Gentiles that maybe Paul was rebuking in this sentence. The purpose of this sentence. We often fall in discipleship circles to present your bodies as a living sacrifice acceptable. Thinking, wait a minute. Is it possible God has saved me but is not going to accept me? Is, 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 do I need to be like the like the like the, the, the prophet told me and know all the in, ins and outs of the word? Do I have to be like the evangelist told me and be winning certain people? Do I have to be like the teacher told me and do all these things correct? Do I have to? No, no, no. That, that's not what Paul is focusing on here. Yes, yes, we are to live holy lives. I'm not. I'm not saying that we don't. But the focus of this passage is our spiritual service of worship. What is he urging the people in Rome to do? The same thing he's urging us to do. He's urging us to worship. Worship. Worship is the act of expressing devotion, reverence, and adoration toward God. Worship is the act of expressing devotion, reverence, and adoration toward God. This, this, hear me, this is what you were created for. This, this is what you were saved for. This is what you are alive for. We are saved to live lives of worship. It said in Psalm chapter 1, Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Or also we read in Psalm 100, Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him in praise his name. We can think when we hear worship, it's this thing that we did before service. It's the songs that we're singing. It's, it's, it's like Psalm 95, 6 says, Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. And we can begin to think that worship is just what we do with our body at a certain part of the service. So we bow down low before God and we let Him know that You are mighty and above us. It's an offering of thanksgiving often that we do out of a heart of abundance. It's something that we do, but Paul, hear me, is talking about something fundamental here. He's talking about something far more elementary. He says, present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God. Let's, let's think about this a little bit. What would this mean to the Jews in Rome? Now, the Jews, of course, grew up... Are, 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 we're all together still, right? Are we, we're, we're together? Are we, are we tracking together here? Are, are we good? Are we good? All right. 
This is important. And I'm a little zealous about it because God has been speaking to me all week. Now, to the Jews, they, they lived the lives with, with, with the temple, right? They had this temple. You commit sins. You bring your sin offering to the temple. You offer this sacrifice. The sacrifice is burned, consumed by God. Sometimes the offering is not actually burned. It's actually given to the priests to eat. Other times it's a wave offering. But the bottom line is the offering is given to God and God does with it what He wants. There was this old system of justice, hear me, that the life of one thing had to be taken to make an offering. But Paul, Paul, Paul appeals to a new system, and in this new system, it's God's mercy. It's not God's justice. God's justice was expressed on the cross. It is now God's mercy. It is His mercy how we got saved. It is His mercy that does not count our sins against us. It's His mercy that sees past all of our shortcomings. God showed us mercy. We've been talking about this Scripture. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Mercy. And the question is, what are you going to do with the mercy God has given you? That's what we've been talking about. Paul appeals to this new system of mercy. Now, you offer a sacrifice to God for Him to consume for His purposes. And Paul says to them, hey, let's live a life of gratitude because God has shown us mercy. We didn't know God. We didn't follow His ways. But instead, we had a tribute that we would give Him sometimes. Every now and then we would give Him something that we thought would make up the gap. And instead of His wrath and punishment, we would, uh, you know, give Him a little something and figure that was enough. I know I'm not following God. I know I'm not doing the right thing, but I'm going to give him this ram and everything's going to be fine. And Paul's like, that's what you, that's the system you want the Gentiles to be under? No, no, no. There's something, there's something far better. He said, instead of living in our foolishness, instead of exalting our own minds as God, he has now shown us mercy. He didn't just turn us over to it any longer. He showed us mercy. Now, the mercy of God is alive on the inside of us. This is the power of the Holy Ghost. And Paul, in light of this power of the Holy Ghost, says we're to live our lives in light of what God has done for us. Oh, this is, this is, this is powerful. This is more than we should ever expect from God. But this is what He does for us. We live a life in light of the mercy God has given us. I wake up in the morning and I think, God has shown me mercy and given me a new day. How am I going to live this life with with God? And so Paul says, you have an offering to give. And it's far better than that ram. It's better than the bull. It's better than the goat. It's better than the pigeon. It's you. And you give your life as an offering to God. Now, this is what Jesus did, right? We know that Jesus gave Himself to the Father and said, Father, You can do whatever You want with me. I'll live however You want me to live. I'll forgive who You want me to forgive. I'll bless who You want me to bless. I will live my life as an offering for You. And because of that one life given as an offering, we all now have the ability to become children of God. This is what Paul said to the church in Philippi. He's like, my life is being poured out as a drink offering. Paul had this revelation. It's not about being cool or not about being the smartest or teaching the most. It's about learning how to lay my life down in a way that I live a life with God that is greater than I ever could have done on my own keeping the law. I was in this... uh, I was in this, this is going to sound silly, but I was, I was in this graduation. I was sitting there, not as excited as some of the people, I'm going to be honest. And, uh, and, I'm, and I'm sitting there, and I said, and I just prayed a simple prayer. I said, Jesus, can you help me to experience this like you would experience this? Holy Spirit, come and, and help me. 
help me to view what's going on around me the way you would move in Jesus when He celebrated with the apostles? Can you help me in my heart to be sensitive to what's happening in the room right now? And, and I, I have to tell you, all of a sudden, I began to feel... I began to feel the rejoicing of the parents who maybe struggled with their kids through being bullied in middle school and they found a place where their kid wouldn't be bullied or, or, or maybe the kid who had the learning disability who needed just a little more help than the, church, the school could give them so they brought them home. And I think of all the, the parents who had to drive their kids to all these meetings and the kids who had been grinding away at school their whole lives and now they're finally going to go off to college. And I, I just, I got to be honest with you, in my heart, I began to feel a supernatural joy that I could not experience on my own. And then I just began to well up with tears thinking, what a day of celebration. I can imagine if Jesus was here, he would be clapping uproariously with the announcement of every graduate. Every graduate who stood and they called his name. I could see just Jesus on the front row. I am proud of you. Great job. I've been for you. I've been praying for you. I've been with you when the tests were hard. I've been with you when you weren't getting, when you weren't fitting in with the other kids in school. I've been with you when you were in that sports competition and you didn't know if you were going to be able to do your best. I could see him there with the parents with his hands hands around their, with around their neck saying, man, good job, Mom. Good job, Dad. Your kid made it. I told you they were going to make it. I told you they were going to make it through school. I told you you were going to be able to do this. I told you I would be with you. And then God was just there celebrating with these families. And I was just overwhelmed with the emotion of God as these these teachers who were there who had been teaching these kids for years and some of them were knuckleheads, I'm sure, and they, they had to endure with these knuckleheads going through school and finally these kids are achieving this life milestone. They're not dropouts, they're not failouts, they're not addicts, they're high school graduates and the pride on the teachers' faces and I just was experiencing the pleasure of God in that mundane moment of life when I decided I'm just going to turn my heart over to Jesus in this moment. They were painting a picture in their speeches about how it's evil out there and it's holy in here. And I'm here to tell you, friend, when you have Jesus in your life, there's no place that's not holy. There's no moment in life Jesus is not present. There's no stepping outside the presence of God to go do life. I, I, I think the the most toxic teachings in Christianity today are that our Christianity is centered around this little time right here when really there is no center. Our center is our time with Jesus. We need to gather together for the preaching of the Word, for worship, for giving, for serving. But Jesus wants to be with us at every moment of our lives. He's actually looking for our lives to be an offering that He can move in and move through. I believe it wholeheartedly, friend. I believe this is what Jesus is calling our church to. Mike, would you come up? Listen, if, if you are in a place in your life that you've been doing Christianity so long that you've got it figured out, maybe you're an expert in Christianity, and, and you feel like I'm, I'm, I'm at any moment now, I'm probably going to be raptured because I'm just so holy and i got this thing so figured out. I'm, at any moment now, I'm... I'm just, you know, and I'm surprised people don't fall down when I walk into Walgreens because I'm so holy and so anointed. Um, oh, uh, I, 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 got a, I got a word for you. Um, Jesus has something better. And if you think like, man, I'm a Christian, I got it all, that's, I did that already, that was something in the past, I, I got a word for you. Jesus has something better. The real way that we live a life of worship is to give our lives to Jesus. Hear me. We get bogged down. And am I getting this right? Am I doing that right? Am I learning enough? We complicate it. And Paul is like, listen. You guys are having conflicts because you're, you're, you're focusing on the wrong thing. You have the wrong center of your Christianity. 
you're centering on what 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 you're doing, and I'm trying to center you on on what you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be an offering to God. We're supposed to be living offerings. An ongoing living offering to Jesus that wherever we are, wherever you find yourself, there is the presence of God. God, whatever you want in this season for me, whatever you want in this moment for me, whatever you want me to experience in this room, that's what I will choose to be. Because I'm an offering to God. And so we've got a lot of Christianity based on well, what do you think about that book or what do you think about this church father? What do, you, what do you think about being a living offering to God? What does that look like to you? What does it look like when you stand in front of the homeless man and he asks you for a couple of dollars and you're like, oh, sorry, bro. Problem. What happens when your friend says, hey, let's just do a little bit of this, a little bit of the problem. No, that's a problem. A living offering. Because as a living offering, we get the benefit of being consumed by God. I want, I want to live a life where I say, Jesus, whatever you want from my life, I say, Amen. Whoever you want me to reach, I say, Amen. If you want a person to know your mercy, put him in my life. I had a, uh, had a run-in with a, a guy recently I've been trying to reach out to. God, God put him in my heart. Hopefully he'll be coming in the next few weeks, but he's got to answer my phone calls first. God put him on my heart, and I started calling, and he wouldn't answer. And I was like, oh, you ain't hiding from me. I just keep calling, I just keep calling, I just keep calling, texting. Ran into him the other day. He's like, ah, oh, I didn't mean to call. I said, don't lie. No, just don't lie. He's like, I just, you know, I think about what to say, and I, I just, I just, don't, don't, just answer the phone. Just answer the phone. You ain't got to lie. Sometimes it be like that, right, Joe? But I ain't giving up. Because God put him on my heart. God, you just take him off my heart. I'll, I'll leave him alone. But you put him on my heart. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm after you. Because God is after you. Why? Because, you know, he's, I believe God has relief for him. And I am willing to look like an, a religious idiot to this guy so he can get the relief Jesus has for him. The healing God has for him. The deliverance God has for him. The peace, the love, the joy. The joy of living life with God. Maybe. I had a conversation recently with a, a friend of mine who's a realtor. And I said, hey, you know, the real estate market's kind of been going crazy lately. With, how's that been for business? And he said to me, hey, I've been doing this long enough that, you know, there's always... Here's what he said. He said, I've been doing this a long time. And I don't worry about what the market does because this isn't just my job, it's my ministry. I'm like, what, what, what are you talking about? He said, listen, there's always, no matter what's happening in the market, there's always people having babies. There's always people sending their kids off to school. There's always people getting married. Always people getting divorced. People getting promotions. People getting promotions. There's always people in transition. And God has placed me in a place where I get to talk to people who are in life transition. And there's no better guide to help you in transition than Jesus. And so as part of my business, I share the gospel with people. This is what I do. It's my ministry. That's a life given to God. There's no separation between what I do and who I am. Yeah, I may make money this way or that way, but my life has been given to God. And maybe you haven't seen the success in some areas of your life because you have not put God's plans first. Maybe God has you in a season of holding so you can learn in this season what does it look like for God to be first in your plans. For the people around you, for your own life, for what He has 
for those around you. I feel like there's people in this room that you are holding miracles that belong to other people. God has you at a place and you've got to release the miracle in somebody's life before they can, before you can move on. He's got you on assignment. Does that make sense at all? I don't want to, I don't want it to be confusing. There's people around you need to be blessed with the miraculous presence of God. Let's finish with our scripture here today. Go back to Romans chapter 12, if you will, please, the very beginning. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. It says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God, present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds to make prove what is the will of God. That which is good, acceptable, and perfect. I'm here to tell you, this is what you were created for. This is what you were created for. You were created to be a worshiper. And worship solves a multitude of problems. Stand with me if you will. God has sent His mercy, and we experience God's mercy as a power that exerts a total and all-encompassing claim over our lives. When we receive God's mercy, we receive God's claim over us. And so right now, just for a couple of minutes, I just want you to just bow your heart before Jesus and say, Lord, I need some more of your mercy. Lord, I, I need more of your grace. Help me. Help me to see life through your eyes. Help me to experience your love for other people. Give me divine appointments to those who need what you have given me. And I will live a life pleasing and acceptable. God. Father, I pray now for the people in the sound of my voice. Father, I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you would be very, very, very close. I feel the anointing over here right now. I feel the anointing coming in right now. And I... Wow. Just, just linger here for a second. Thank you, Jesus. Wow. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you send breakthrough right now. Send breakthrough right now, Jesus. Oh. Send breakthrough, Lord Jesus. Send breakthrough, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Lord Jesus, we give our lives to you with a full expectation that you will now anoint us to do the impossible. Wow. I don't know if there's somebody in the room or somebody online, but I just, I'm hearing this someone saying, you know, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't even cry out God. I can't do it. I can't do this. I can't do this. I don't know what this is. God has not told me, but I hear it. And I believe God wants me to pray for you that you are going to make it. You are going to make it. God is for you. The devil is a liar. That's who I want to pray for you uh, if you're here in person. I don't know, it could be something that you're going to carry to somebody out there, but I just feel I want to open up for that first. You've been wrestling with discouragement this week, and God is saying, 